Hello and welcome to We Random episode 15. This is coming out on Thanksgiving week. And instead of doing something stupid for the intro, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you that is here with us. Thank you so much, everybody. More after this. Almost Qualified Productions. Let's get crazy! Experts don't have this much fun. Welcome to We Random, episode 15. I'm Brian. That's Christopher, also known as Santa Scanzi, if you're watching on the Twitch stream. How are you doing this afternoon, Christopher? You know, I'm not feeling great, but uh, we're going to have a great podcast, so that makes up for it. We are. We've got a ton of topics. We're going to do the best we can to get through what we can get through today. We're going to use our nice wheel of doom here to tell us what we're going to talk about. We are in our uh, second voyage as streamers on Twitch dot tv backslash sconzi so you can watch uh santa sconzi in his nice mug there and you can see a nice uh photograph of me right there and you can know that i um landmark mke on twitter have acquired dino s'mores for cash considerations and there is no tampering that has been suspected so this is a fairly legal deal that has happened so today we are a beer sponsored podcast okay let's go for it all right, you ready to spin this wheel? Yeah, we got a ton of stuff on the wheel, so let's spin it up. And hopefully, if things work right on stream, you should see it right over there spinning for us. Oh, look let's at that. It. It's gorgeous. We're starting with the fleet, B. What is the fleet all about? Fleet, fleet, fleet. All right. So, this week, Twitter made big news when they added a feature called Fleets, which works similar to Instagram stories, Facebook stories, or any other kind of stories that you're used to. Um, Fleets are for sharing momentary thoughts and they help to start conversations. They're going to stick around on your Twitter for only 24 hours and you are able to tweet pictures and text and do retweets of other tweets. And this came about with Twitter doing some different testing in countries like Brazil and Italy and India and South Korea. The company says they learned that fleets helped people feel more connected in joining conversations. Twitter says that people with fleets were able to talk more on Twitter and that new users found fleets to be an easier way to share what's on their mind. Because these disappear from view after 24 hours, fleets helped people feel more comfortable sharing personal and casual thoughts, opinions, and feelings. Do you have any casual thoughts, opinions, or feelings about this, Christopher? I don't know how casual they are, but I got some thoughts. Like, who the fuck is going to share shit online that is personal stuff anyway? Like, come on. And I don't, I, you know, I've been playing around with the fleet thing because I kind of like it, right? I, I, I don't really use Facebook all that much, so I don't use their stories that was ripped off from Instagram and I don't really use their stories and they ripped it off from Snapchat. I don't really use them all that much either, but you know, I'm on Twitter quite a bit more, more often. So I thought this would be kind of cool and you know, I've thrown some out there. It's okay. But I don't like the fact that there's like no conversation with it. Like, like if somebody has their DMS open, apparently I can respond to them via DM, but why the fuck would somebody want a shit ton of DMS coming through? on this random passing thought that they had. So, you know, I kind of I kind of like it in a way, but there's a lot of things that don't make a whole lot of sense to me. And getting back to the thought that, oh, well, people feel like they can share their stuff more. Like, it's still there forever. Like, someone still screenshot that at any point. Like, you're not sharing anything more there than you would show, share on Twitter anyway. And if you are not already using some sort of a uh, third-party service to delete your tweets after a certain amount of time, you got a problem. You need to set that up because... You don't want to run into one of these people that get, you know, Josh Hader or a tweet from 78 years ago comes up and they're like, oh my God, you're the worst person in the world. That or you just don't treat, you know, tweet racist or homophobic or any of these other things to begin with. And then you don't have to worry about what you tweeted 10 years sure, ago. Sure, I get that. But you know what? People are going to share stuff that isn't that egregious and it's stuff that they're not going to want out there, you know, maybe tomorrow, maybe in right. a week, maybe in a year. And I mean, you shouldn't put that out there to begin with. I get that. But you also, like, why would you put it out there on the thing that only lasts for 24? Like, why would you put it there but not on Twitter itself? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I agree. I think this is more 
geared towards like interacting about like sports or like movie awards or things like that where like you don't necessarily need all of these tweets in your timeline but these are things where you can interact with other people like i barely check my instagram stories as it is so i'm gonna have a hard time keeping up with these fleets and i agree with you the internet never forgets so just because you post a fleet and you're like, oh, it's only going to be up there for 24 hours, people are going to screenshot that. Like we've seen this time and time again mm -hmm. with Instagram stories and videos and posts and things like that. Somebody puts something up for six minutes and they're like, oh, I'm going to delete that. But right. now there's 12 people on the Internet who have already screen captured it and done the iPhone record and they've got your whole video and they're reposting it. Like, look what Kelly Stafford said right. and like all of this stuff. Well, Kelly Stafford's a fucking idiot for what she said, but that's neither here nor there. But is it on the run sheet? <laughs> it's not, but it probably should have been because Jesus Christ. Actually, it is on the run sheet, but uh, we'll get to that later, maybe. <laughs> okay. Other thoughts on the fleets, Christopher? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Are you feeling like it's something that you'll, like you said, you've used it, but is it something that you feel like you could get into your general brand? Possibly. I mean, I, I, I've thrown some stuff out there and I take a look and I see how many people have interacted with it. But, but for me, social media isn't a one way street and that's what the fleets are. It's just a one way street. You know, if I put stuff out there, it's really for interacting with people. That's, that's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's in the fucking name. It's social media, right? You need to be social. You should be, you should be interacting with people. So yes, I'll probably still use it to some degree, especially if I start to see some kind of a take rate with it. But it's not something that's going to replace normal tweets by any means. Um, and it's probably not something that's going to be a huge part of what I do. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Is the biggest feature the fact that you can actually see who looked at your fleet as to where with your regular tweets, like you can get some of that, but I don't think you can drill down to that specific user data. Is that part of why fleets are a thing? Because people want to see, oh, who's looking at me? Well, maybe to some degree. I mean, it's helpful for me because I know I've got a lot of support from, you know, friends for the whole streaming thing that I do. So it's kind of nice for me to see how many people that have viewed this are friends, which I would expect probably a higher view rate than people that don't know me, right? So it's interesting in that regard that I can see who it is that actually looked at it. Um, but outside of that, I don't know that there's a huge value. And if you're somebody who's got a million followers, like you're not going to like scroll through that thing anyway, it's kind of useless for them. That's fair. So I think our sum is a meh on this topic. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right. Well, tweets, fleets, mess. <laughs> Next topic. Spinning it up. Let's do it. Oh, it didn't take it off the wheel. Why didn't it take it off the wheel? Fleets came up again. Advanced option. Apparently, we just have to talk about it so Remove much. Remove the choice after it's so landed So much All about right. fleets. Well, if fleet comes up again, it'll disappear on its own. Uh, the NFL has a diversity hiring plan. Tell us about that. So, this past week, the NFL, well, it was a couple weeks ago that they announced a diversity hiring plan. A new plan was launched to incentivize NFL teams to develop and hire minority candidates for head coaching and general manager positions. This plan, according to anonymous sources, because you know anonymous sources, yep. has not been met with the enthusiasm that the people who created it hoped it would be met with. Multiple sources who are people of color, according to Adam Schefter, um, said in recent days that there are at best mixed feelings about this plan. Um, the plan in particular awards two third round compensatory draft picks to teams that have minority head coaches or general managers hired away from their organization. So a couple of the comments that were shared from these anonymous sources, um, they were not pleased that many individuals were not consulted about the plan and that it was passed swiftly without any advance notice. The sources also did not approve of other people speaking for them when they were unable to provide their own input um, another thing that one of the sources was not pleased about was that this plan does not um, set things up in a competitive way in the sense that, for example, the Patriots had a um, individual who was hired by the Dolphins, and that's an in-division rival. So if this plan were in place, would the Dolphins have been 
more willing or less willing to hire this person, knowing that their division opponent would then be getting third round picks for hiring him. So the thing that the NFL is trying to address is the fact that entering 2020, there were four minority head coaches and two minority general managers. So if you think about that, there are 32 teams, which means that there are 64 head coaches and general managers, and six of them are individuals of minority. So I've got a lot of thoughts about this, and I kind of want to spout off on it for a minute if you're okay with that. Do it. So my first thought about this is, why are you only looking at head coaches and general managers? What I feel like would be the best way to look at this is, is how do you create the most diverse working environment through your organization top down? You know, instead of saying, oh, we're going to reward you if you have a general manager or coach hired away from you, we're going to reward you if 50% or 60% or 75% of your organization is from a diverse background, or we're going to reward you if you are promoting individuals of diverse background or set up these conditions, because I don't necessarily feel like it's fair for a team to get rewarded for hiring away a member of diversity from another team. But if that team progresses that person up through the ranks from an assistant coach to a head coach to a general manager, that team's not getting compensated for that. Now, again, let me step back. We as a society should not have to compensate people for doing the right thing and hiring the most qualified candidate, right? That is a full stop because if this person is the most qualified candidate, they should be hired. If they're not the most qualified candidate, maybe we shouldn't hire them. But that's why I'm coming from this perspective of try to encourage individuals from the top down because the more diversity that you get at the lowest levels of your organization, the more diversity that you may eventually cultivate to be in the highest level of your organization. What are your thoughts here, Christopher? Yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's, it, I don't, I don't know that the compensation thing really makes a whole lot of sense to me. To your point, you know, a team could be, re they're going to be rewarding another team for developing somebody, but the person who developed the team that developed that person, there's no, uh, there's no recompense there, right? There's there's no reward for them. So it seems a little bit backwards. I think the way that the NFL is run, I think it it could even be a hindrance. You could see even fewer, um, you know, people of color, minorities who are hired into those positions just because I don't want to give an edge to a team that uh, that I'm going to have to play at some point, whether it's a division team or not. So yeah, I'm not I'm not 100 sold on that. I don't know that that's the best idea. Uh, I, I do agree with you, though, that you have to, you know, it has to start with the lower ranks, right? That's where you have to get people to be brought in and, um, you know, work up to that point where, where people see them as potential head coaches or GMs or, or other, you know, top positions in the, in, the, in the team or in the league. And so I think there needs to be some sort of reward for having some sort of a system in place that, that you are cultivating this talent because that's the that's the big part like it's easy to go out there and hire somebody um but you need to be rewarded for for all of that you know bringing stuff up and whatever and on the flip side shouldn't there be some sort of you know reward outside of the fact that you're getting a good hire for the people that hire these individuals right so i don't know i i think that this is first of all it's good it's a step in the right direction right because we need to do something to try to get the the, the front offices and the top position in these um, in the league to look more like the people that are on the field, right? I mean, the, the league is like, what, 60%, 70% black, for God's sake. And so why are there so few black people in those positions? That's a problem. That's an issue. And so, um, yeah, I think there, I, I don't know that this is the answer. In fact, I feel very strongly this is not the answer. Um, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I feel like it's a very cosmetic thing. And one of the things that I think about, too, is that when you look at teams that are needing to hire head coaches and general managers, those are typically teams that are not doing well. Right. So if you're picking someone who is a minority candidate and you're prioritizing the fact that they're a minority candidate over whatever qualifications that they have, like, what is that going to do for that person? We've seen minority candidates like Romeo Cornell and um, Jim Caldwell and some of these other folks and yep. they've gotten jobs and they've been the head coach for like a hot ass dumpster fire team. 
and then they're back to being a you know coordinator somewhere does that mean that they were or wouldn't were not good coaches we don't know because you know sometimes it could be them sometimes it could be the team but that's part of this problem is that when these individuals are getting those opportunities people aren't just judging them by the win loss record on the field they're probably judging them by the color of their skin too and i think that's a big challenge here so yes the nfl is trying something but i don't think that it's the solution yeah and to your point i mean the a lot of times a new head coach is being brought into a, 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 a the deck is stacked against them pretty heavily um and on top of that because we have a history where there's not a lot of black coaches or people of color in the nfl they are inherently going to be most likely a new head coach right they're not they don't have a history behind them so so there's nothing you can build off of and all you're looking at is this one time that they had that opportunity and they weren't necessarily successful and and the deck is stacked against them right they're they're on a team that most likely is garbage that's why they're picking up a new coach um and it does it doesn't help their ability to move up which again is why i think it's so important that you start from the bottom up and you start getting people and stacking uh stacking front offices stacking coaching staffs with a bunch of these individuals who can who can then take that next step Sounds great. Well, if Roger Goodell ever climbs out from underneath his desk, we can give him episode 15 of We <laughs> Random, and then maybe he can have a good idea of how to proceed forward. But I'd say for now, I think we're good and can spin the wheel. What are your thoughts? I'm spinning it right now, man. You know, people like to eat paste, so, you know, they hang out under the desk and they eat their paste, and then yeah, that's how it goes. Exactly. All right, we got something here about App Store fees. All right. So now... We are moving into another uh, hotly contested company. We've moved away from the NFL, and we're talking about Apple. So Apple has announced that it will cut the amount of commission it charges app developers as part of a new small business program. Developers who are earning less than $1 million per year will now see a decrease in the amount of commission that they have to pay at 15%. That is half the current rate of 30%. Apple says the program, which will begin on January 1st of 2021, will apply to app sales and in-app purchases and will benefit the vast majority of developers on the platform. Apple CEO Tim Cook says that small businesses are the backbone of Apple's global economy and that the program will help them write the next chapter of creativity and prosperity on the App Store. The basic gist of this thing is that for those who are making less than $1 million, they're going to pay that 15% commission. If their fees hit the $1 million, then the 30% kicks back in. So Apple says that the fees that they take are used to provide a safe and secure app development world and sales platform for developers and users. So Apple also says that it enables these uh, companies to access a market of 1.5 billion Apple devices in use around the world. So I think that this is interesting. I don't know all the math, you know, I'm not over here crunching numbers, but I feel like this is something that is interesting. And for those folks who are really those small businesses, I feel like every dollar, especially in this COVID world is gonna help them. I think that this is probably a good thing. What are your thoughts, Christopher? Well, again, I think this is similar to the NFL topic where it's not really a, a full blown solution, but it's a step in the right direction, right? So. I want to start with one of the one of the last things you said, which is um, when Apple talks about the benefit to the App Store, they talk about how it gives companies or gives developers access to a market of around one and a half billion Apple devices, which is great. And that sounds amazing. But here's the catch is if Apple didn't have a closed in ecosystem, then they couldn't use that as a selling point. Right. So the reason it's a selling point is because if people have an iOS device or, or an Apple device, they need to go to that app store in order to get the device in order to get the application but if it wasn't closed off now they don't need to go there so you know apple's kind of using that to their advantage they've locked things down and so we've got this huge user base that can only come here but what if they can't only come here now all of a sudden there's an issue and that's part of the reason why apple wants to keep that closed gate because it gives them that stranglehold on on the app developers that are creating for ios that's also a reason why you know, there may be an antitrust lawsuit coming that way. I'm sure they've probably had some before anyway, but there may be an antitrust lawsuit coming that says that they've kind of got a monopoly on that that app store. 
I personally am not horribly heartbroken over the App Store. We've talked about this ad nauseum, so we don't need to dive into it too much. But I think this is a step in the right direction. Drop the fees for those uh, developers who are maybe just starting out or on small, smaller um, companies. I think that's a good thing. I mean, it, it, you can't look at it and say it's a bad thing. Um, a lot of the big time companies, of course, are going to say, oh, shit, dude, I think you're right. I think I forgot to hit record. B just hit me up in the chat there. Said, hey, I don't think we're recording. <laughs> You're right, we're not. Shit, I'm recording it in uh, in Twitch, though. I guess we're just going to see how this extracts from Twitch. Huh? I guess we're going to have to. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see how uh, how the audio pulls out of that. Oh, well, that's, that's what right. we got. Well, con- well, continue your point. I don't know where it was anymore. So I broke Christopher's brain because I'm sitting over here like I usually track our time in the Zencaster thing. But with Apple, I think it's a good point. Like they have a lot of that antitrust stuff. But I mean, small steps like this and like we talked about last week where they threaten that company with kind of like a cease and desist. And now they're like, oh, we're going to work with you. Hopefully these small steps can continue to help them develop because, you know, Apple has a great ecosystem but they also need to be willing to give a little bit for more people to buy in. And that's, like you said, similar to this NFL issue. So I think we hit two back-to-back issues that kind of have the same feel. Like, yeah. Thanks for doing something, but you could really be doing more. Yeah, I think that kind of sums it up. And obviously this isn't going to solve any of the issues that you know Epic and some of those giant companies have with Apple. So again, step in the right direction. It certainly makes them look a little bit better to lawmakers if in you know, if people are looking at Apple as a, as an antitrust lawsuit recipient. So I'm sure that plays a part of a role into why they're doing that too. For sure. Well, let's spin the wheel and see what else we can get to. What do you say? All right. Still waiting for Fleet to show back up. Fleet, Fleet, Fleet. Apparently it's not removing everything either. But uh, we got a Bucks trade. What's that all about? Oh, we got the Bucks trade. So... The Milwaukee Bucks have been making some moves recently. After having a meeting with their star player, Giannis Adentacumbo, the Bucks are trying to make some moves. So they traded for um, Jeru Holiday, who is a person who I don't know a whole lot about. I'm not going to lie to you, but a lot of people on Twitter are really excited. And a lot of NBA folks are like, oh, he's a great two-way point guard, and he's going to really help the team. And then the Bucks were working on a sign-and-trade for um, Bogdan Bogdanovich, who was a player for the Sacramento Kings. They arranged a sign-and-trade a sign and trade deal, and the report included several players and compensation for Bogdanovich, who is headed towards restricted free agency. This report came out four days before the start of free agency. The Athletic reported that the arrangement is now in peril and is being basically blown up because Bogdan had not agreed to the contract terms at the core of the sign and trade. So now the NBA has decided that they're going to look into this and see if the Milwaukee Bucks are tampering. Now, a lot of people on Twitter and a lot of people in the NBA community find that to be laughable, considering that, uh, you know, the Lakers are notorious for doing this with Anthony Davis, the Clippers did it with Kawhi, the Celtics are doing it right now with Gordon Hayward, and guess what? You know who's now in the driver's seat to sign Bogdanovic in restricted free agency? I'll give you one guess, Christopher. Probably the fucking Lakers. Yep. (laughs) So this is a prime example of the NBA and folks generally trying to squeeze this small market, right? Yeah. Like they're nitpicking this thing that the Bucks did when this is something that has been happening for years in the NBA with these big markets. That's how these super teams have gotten formed. People have been trying to hit up Giannis since he came out the crib. Every all-star game, every game, every coach, people are like, Giannis go to Miami. Yana should go to Philadelphia. Yana should go to Chicago. Yana should go to Lakers. Yana should go here. Yana should go there. But that's not tampering. But, oh, you know, the fact that we want to trade for Ursan Ilyasova, except for like six years younger, but probably three years younger because they're all like six years older than the age that's on their ESPN bio. And that's tampering. <laughs> Come on, man. 
Well, I think I know like two of the names that you just ran off in that whole rant you had there. I don't really follow the, the NBA a whole lot, but the one thing I will talk about is, you know, I agree that tampering to one degree or another happens all the freaking time, right? All the time. Um, I, 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 don't, I haven't read up on this a whole lot, so I'm not sure exactly what the tampering claim specifically is, but if it was a sign and then a trade, the, the, there's there's no evidence there. Like, the Bucks don't have to be involved in a sign and trade. Like, what I'm saying is the sign portion of it might have happened ahead of time, right? But the trade portion of it doesn't necessarily need to happen before that free agency thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, I, I, right. you would you would think that there'd want to be some sort of conversation that uh, this player wants to play for that team, right? So there, there's some of that. But um, I don't know. I, I don't know what all the specifics are. I doubt all the specifics are even out there to begin with. Um, it To me, with, with virtually zero knowledge of the situation, my default is the same thing that you said, that it's more of the you know, a, a case of the rich trying to get richer and trying to keep the poor guy down. Right. And I feel like that's really what it is. And obviously I think the thing here is the Kings and the Bucks probably were working together. Let's just call it what it is. Right. But at the same time, somebody on the King side made that air of not taking it to the player and saying, Hey, we're going to try to sign you and then send you to Milwaukee. Right. And then maybe the players kind of heard about that and he's a little salty and then this becomes a whole thing. But this thing has been happening, like I said, for years. Like right now, there came out a report. So a couple of days ago, Gordon Hayward's like, hey, I don't want to be in the Celtics anymore. All of a sudden today, it's like, oh, Indiana been talking about Gordon Hayward and they want to trade Victor Oladipo. And the Celtics want, you know, Rick Schmitz or whatever. Right. And it's like, and that's not tampering, but the Bucks thing is, if it's tampering, it's tampering. If it's not, it's not. Just call it what it is. Stop picking on one person when you don't pick on anybody else. Oh, yeah. And again, not knowing all the specifics of it, but like the way it could very easily have played out is, you know, hey, we we are interested in a player or maybe interested in a player or this the the Kings might say, well, we know we can't sign, you know, keep this guy or he doesn't want to play with us or whatever the case may be. Let's start talking about what the options are out there. Like, I don't think that qualifies as tampering. Maybe it is. I don't know. But uh, I don't know. Again, it's it seems like it's probably just uh, more of the big markets determining what's going to happen because that's how the NBA has always been run anyway. It is. And we're not going to take it anymore, Christopher. We're not going to take yeah, it. Yeah, down with the NBA. <laughs> we are not a white supremacist podcast. Oh, no. I don't, I have no, I, <laughs> I don't give a shit if they're white, black, or purple. <laughs> I, just, I just don't care for the NBA. And the governing body is complete trash. And I don't know that there's too many it's people that could ever argue that. It's only because you missed Tim Duncan. Let's keep That's it real. That's true. Like if, Tim Duncan were, if Tim Duncan were still playing, you would be all about the You are 100% correct. I would. Now that Timmy's gone, it just ain't the same. I just don't give a damn anymore. He's coaching for somebody. I don't remember who. I, isn't he coaching for Pop? Isn't he, was, he like yeah, one there's, of Pop's assistants? There was talk that he might take over for Pop. I don't know if that's... Uh, again, I don't really follow it anymore, but... Um, we'll see, we'll see if that turns out to be something. I don't know. That was your Sacra or not Sacramento. That was your San Antonio Spurs chat featured <laughs> by We Random. Now we're going to spin the wheel and see what the next topic we can get. I figured we're going to get fleet again. Well, you know, we could make that a fleet if we want. <laughs> we should just make this podcast a fleet. We probably should, especially because <laughs> it didn't record right. Uh, 15 minute city B. What's this all about? All right. So I, as a visually impaired man, saw this article, and I was really kind of interested and excited by it. So um, there are a few different cities, example, Paris and Portland. Some cities are attempting to give residents everything they need within a few minutes of their front doors. A question is, can it work? And can it be something that happens without leaving anyone out? The 15-minute city represents the possibility of a decentralized city, says Carlos Moreno, a scientific director and professor specializing in systems and innovation at the University of Paris. At its heart, the concept is mixing urban social functions to create a vibrant vicinity. So for example, one of the um, places in Paris, they've built it where they've got gardens and they've got daycares and they've got different jobs and they've got housing units and grocery stores and things like that, all in a 15 minute area. 
And because you're not as reliant on cars in that area, you can eliminate pollution, you can make way for gardens and bike lanes and leisure facilities. And it's something where people can walk or use public transportation to get to these places where they are able to do that without the expense or obligation of a car. Um, this is not something that's necessarily new as since urban planning from the 20th century had industry on the outskirts and residential areas around the city with commerce at the core, people have been looking for another way to do this, but it seems like there are still things that are a long way to go. For example, Detroit is a city that wants to do something like this, but right now the urban function is out of reach for the vast majority of people as 30,000 citizens lack access to a full service grocery store, right? So this is just something that I thought is really interesting because if this is a trend, it could be something that's really helpful. And I think it is in some ways, something that we sometimes see like out in the suburbs right because like you'll go to this suburban town and like everything is just on this like one strip right like you've got six restaurants and a grocery store right. and this industrial park where you've got the amazon warehouse and like this you know freighter urgent clinic and all this stuff but i really love this as somebody who can't drive like this would be great for me and i kind of wish that this was something that was a thing now what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think this is a really cool idea. And um, I think the thing that really jumps at me for the, the biggest impact is going to be some of the areas, especially in urban areas, there's a lot of food deserts in these big cities. You know, Milwaukee's got it and Detroit's got it and you'll see it in Miami and all these big cities. You know, you have these food deserts where um, a lot of a lot of the population, and I think it's in your notes here, they don't have access to full grocery stores. You know, they you find these individuals are eating less healthy food because they just flat don't have access to food, whether it's because they don't have the transportation to get to where the food's at or, you know, maybe, maybe the cost is prohibitive. Um, but the biggest thing is, to your point, is that, you know, a lot of these places are, you know, these might be individuals who just don't have a vehicle. You know, I need to drive. I need to ride the bus everywhere. The situation you're in. Right. And so if if I have to take a two hour bus ride to get to the closest grocery store that's going to have fresh produce for my family. Am I going to do that? Or am I going to go to the corner grocery market and get some, you know, canned beans or something? You know what I mean? It's much, much, um, it's much more difficult for a lot of people to get the, the food that they really need. And that's where I think this really comes in. I'm sure there's a lot of other benefits, you know, you know, especially for people in that same kind of situation, whether it's daycare, you know, whether it's banking, all of those things are important. Um, but the one that I think really touches me, and especially as we're coming up on the Thanksgiving holiday, so it's uh, kind of topical, is the fact that um, these food deserts are a real problem. For sure. And I think that this is interesting, and I'd love to see how this continues to progress. Yeah, me too. That's a, it's a very interesting thought. Cool. Well, let's spin the wheel and send out a few thoughts of hope for this in the future. All righty. Fleet. All right, well, hopefully it actually takes it off this time. <laughs> we'll spin again. <laughs> oh, nope, fleet. <laughs> WWE hates Twitch. I don't know. I don't think it's like just Twitch, you... but uh, yeah. I like how you titled it WWE hates Twitch. <laughs> but this is one that I added, and then I think you might have seen it and added it. But um, the title that I have is WWE makes an example out of Zelina Vega. So as we previously discussed, WWE has been cracking down on their sports entertainers' use of third-party apps, such as Twitch and Cameo. Um, Zelina Vega, real name Thea Trinidad, was released by WWE to the shock of wrestling fans. It was the latest in the mounting feud between the company and its talent over the ownership and use of third-party apps, most notably Twitch. Um, Vega's release was announced 10 minutes after she tweeted about her support of unionization in wrestling, which led many to suspect that there was a cause and effect here, and then maybe she had actually been fired before the tweet. Unionization in wrestling has long been feared as an existential threat to wrestling, especially the WWE, with Vince McMahon fighting the process as far back as 1986. In 1986, Hulk Hogan 
ratted out unionization talk in the locker room, keeping himself in the good graces of McMahon, while the leader of the movement, a former governor, Jesse Ventura, was threatened by McMahon that he would be fired if he ever brought up unionization again. So in this instance, Zelina was refusing to hand over information about her Twitch account, and she had started an OnlyFans account where um, individuals could subscribe to her OnlyFans and she could post pictures of her doing cosplay and some of these other things. It was reported that Vega was told in no uncertain terms to either give up her Twitch or be fired, and she chose to be fired. So this has become a prime concern, not only in the wrestling business, but also the political atmosphere is starting to take note of this. For example, Andrew Yang, who was a former presidential candidate, has openly come out and said that something needs to be done about how WWE calls their wrestlers independent contractors, which allows WWE to not provide health care or benefits while controlling the individual rights of their employees, which that part is kind of flying in the face of the intent of people being independent contractors. Yeah, I, I, I think it's clear. We've had conversations around the WWE, which, which you're a big fan of um, in the past. I couldn't care less about WWE. I have no interest, but I do have a lot of, a lot of thoughts about the way Vince McMahon runs his empire. Uh, the guy is a piece of trash in and inside and out. Like he's just garbage from start to finish. And um, the, the, the independent contractor thing, like clearly this is something that he does because it allows him to have a lot more control. He doesn't have to pay benefits for people. I mean, these are people who are like sacrificing their lives on the shit that they're doing. And he doesn't even pay freaking healthcare for these people. Um, he wants to have all the control over absolutely everything that they do. It's, it's insane. And I think that if they, if they unionize it, it could spell the end of WWE potentially, um, but at least it would get workers some protection, right? Like, I think it's insane that they don't have that. Um, I understand, again, this is rehashing what we've talked about in previous episodes. I understand why McMahon feels like he, you know, has some sort of, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Control isn't what I'm looking for, but some sort of vested interest in, in these individuals and the brand that they have, right? Because he probably has a big hand or his company had a big hand in creating the brand for these individuals that they are then peddling on the side for their own benefit. You know, it's uh, I get that. You can't do that if it's if it's not a brand that you own. So I, I get that. But, but I think that just kind of goes to the fact the way that this situation is set up is really the problem. That's what needs to change. Obviously, McMahon wanting to get his, you know, his hands in the pocket of everybody for for whatever they're doing, OnlyFans or Twitch or Cameo or whatever the case may be, is that's just McMahon being McMahon. But the real issue is the way that the structure is set up in that company, and hopefully something changes because it's it's garbage the way that it is. Right. Well, and it's interesting. I listened to a wrestling podcast and one of the former WWE wrestlers, uh, Bully Ray, he kind of weighed in on this. And he's like, basically what WWE is going to do is they're going to create their own Twitch accounts. And they're going to say, here you go. You can have Twitch. But here's the catch. When you do this, whatever money you make goes towards what's called your downside guarantee. So the way that wrestling contracts are generally set up is you have what's called a downside guarantee, and then you have accelerants from that. So if you have a downside guarantee of $200,000, if they make you sit home and you don't do anything, they're still going to pay you $2,000. So the way that they're going to try to work it is, sure, you can do Twitch, but if you make you know $1,500 from your Twitch, that $1,500 is $1,500 less that we have to pay you to sit home. Gotcha. And, and that's one of the things that Bully Ray was like, I'm not cool with that. Because if you're going to give me this downside guarantee and tell me if I sit home, you're going to pay me $200,000, why am I going to go do this work on a side that I was making this $1,500 that was an addition to my downside guarantee. And now all of a sudden I'm making that money for you. Right. No, I completely <laughs> agree. Like that's exactly what it is. He just wants that money and it, it helps him keep control on people. Right. Cause if you have that wrestler that makes 200,000 or a hundred thousand or whatever, right. Um, 
I guarantee that even though that sounds like a shit ton of money to me and to probably most of the people that are watching or listening to this, you know, there's going to be some of them where it's like, I need more money for whatever the case may be. I mean, hell, if they have to pay for their own health care. That alone could eat up half of that fucking money, for God's sake. So look, they're looking for some extra money on the side, right? Now, some of this may just be, I want to do it out of the goodness of my heart. I want to do it because it's fun. Like, I'm not making that shit ton of money. I don't make hardly any money off streaming. I just do it because I enjoy it. That's why I want to do it. And there could be some of that too. But if they're making money off of it, then obviously that that's that's something that they're they're they they're needing for whatever reason, right? And so if McMahon can keep these people in a situation where um, you need that extra money, but I'm going to keep you from being able to get that extra money, it just reasserts his control of those individuals. And again, that's what McMahon's all about: is control. So yeah, the whole thing is it just is. garbage. It really is. It is. So there's a lot more that I could say about it, but I feel like you've summed it up completely well and it's kind of what it is. So it sucks, but we will definitely see Zelina Vega elsewhere. And if you really want to find her, I guess she might still be on OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> you might you might see a lot of her there. I don't know. I don't know. I'm married, so I have no oh, idea. Oh, come about on. Very people look stuff. at that stuff, too. Don't use that as an excuse. All right, let's go ahead and spin the wheel. <laughs> it's a good segue. Oh, which one is that? Election follow-up. What are we following up on the election with, B? Oh, good. We get to talk <laughs> about the election. Every, everyone's, so, everyone's on the, the edge of their seat to find out what's happening at the election. All right. So I had three points that I noted for the election follow-up. The first one is the one that's the clearest. Um, Georgia has completed their re recount. And they certified that Joe Biden won the state of Georgia. So it seems like that is done and gone. Well, not, not necessarily. So I read actually something a couple hours ago where um, Georgia came back out and said, well, no, wait, it's not quite certified just yet. Oh, good. Time. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, speaking of uh, certifying things and then decertifying things and then certifying them and decertifying them. Fucking Michigan. The, um, yep. Michigan GOP election officials want to rescind their votes to certify Wayne County where Detroit is in the election results. And then we have in Wisconsin, Wisconsin is recounting Milwaukee and Dane County. I guess why I wanted to talk about this is what I don't understand is how can we just like nitpick and choose these things? We can be like, well, we're only going to recount these votes, but all these other votes are totally cool and legitimate. Like, how does that work? Like, what are we doing here? We're trying to steal an election. Do you know damn well what we're trying to do here? Like, I don't, well, like, I don't want to look at the Well, how is this even legal? It's not. That's the thing. He's just waving his, you know, I'm the president dick around in everybody's face and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. If you go back to the Mich Michigan thing, there was a report that came out that after these electors, and I don't remember the, the exact uh, title, but after they, they came to an agreement that they were going to certify the results, Trump calls one of the Republican people and uh like 10 minutes later suddenly she's like oh i want to rescind it i don't want to agree to this it's like this dude is just putting the pressure of the oval office on people and it's it's insanely inappropriate it's probably fucking illegal it's it's i i don't understand how people aren't losing their goddamn minds over this shit like the guy is legitimately trying to steal the election and he's doing everything he can right out in the fucking open and people are letting this shit happen and like what I don't understand is these are numbers. It's not like we're just like making stuff up here. How can we be like, well, two of these people want to certify these votes, but two of these people don't like what are like, okay, you counted. We all grew up watching the count. One, two, three, <laughs> four, ha, 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 right? Like, how are you going to be like, well, that's not 7,025, right? Like these are numbers. These are not like subjective things we can't be like well according to my research blah 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 like these are numbers it either is or it is not right yeah but here's the thing is people are in charge of counting those numbers right they're getting to those numbers people are responsible for certifying that they're correct people are responsible for saying everything's on the up and up there's nothing wrong here you know if we talk about the electoral college people are taking those numbers and saying, okay, the numbers say this, so this is our vote. There's a whole lot of people involved there that have to do what they're supposed to do 
in order for things to end up the way that they should end up, right? And that's what Numbnuts is trying to do, is he's trying to influence all of these people in that chain of custody, because all he needs is a couple people to, you know, be a little wavery and, and have morals that are as bankrupt as he has in the fucking GOP, and get a couple of those people to flip around, and, and shit could get extra, extra crazy. So that's what he's trying to do. Like, the numbers are what they are. I honestly believe that all this recount stuff in the... Um, all the, the the lawsuits that he's filing, I really think a lot of that is just smokescreen. I think what he's trying to do is one, trying to sway the individuals that are responsible, the people that actually can make some of those decisions, and he's trying to get his base all riled up in case he has to go nuclear. That's what I really think the that he's trying to do, because there's no basis in in this stuff that he's throwing out. I mean, the fact that those lawsuits are getting thrown out left and right, it's really about those individual people that he's trying to put pressure on awful it is it's disgusting it's if i wasn't already sick to my stomach it would make me more sick to my stomach i agree so at this point i think we should spin the wheel but i also think we're probably down to two topics so i think we're gonna spin one here we got like and then eight what topics, we'll do man. i know but we got time we're keeping track of time this week so we're gonna let the wheel di dictate a topic here and then chat since we are live on twitch look at this wheel and put in the chat the topic that you want us to talk about as our final topic. Okay. And we'll do that. I like it. A couple of these we have talked about already, though. So the wheel hasn't been set up right. But we're spinning. Here comes the spin. Well, well we talked about fleet like four times. So <laughs> if they did. tell us that we have to talk about fleets, then we'll talk about fleets again. Uh, so this one is titled, Is Harry Styles a Man? Oh. Now you're a man. <laughs> a man, man, man. I don't know what that means, <laughs> you know, anybody... but go for it. Come on, you you never watched like South Park? <laughs> no, not really. Okay, so um, Harry Styles, who I had to Google to figure out who that was, <laughs> um, he made history as the first solo man to grace the cover of Vogue magazine. Not a boy. Some individuals, some individuals were not loving the star's parade of gender blurring looks in the fashion magazine. Um, some people said there is no society that can survive without strong men the east knows this in the west the steady feminization of our men at the same time that marxism is being taught to our children is not a coincidence and other people came back to say that that was garbage they also said that um in the East and the West, there are clothing worn such as the um, kilt in Scotland and in France and China. There are garments that are dressed like. So basically what happened here is Harry Styles wore some type of dress on the cover of Vogue. And people got all up in their feelings about it. And they were like, we need manly men. And then there were other people that were like, the most manly of men is a man who is comfortable being whoever he wants to be, right? And my number one thought on this is clothes don't have a gender. Clo clothing is a piece of fabric. It's a shirt. A man can put on a shirt. A woman can put on a shirt. A transgender individual can put on a shirt. Anyone can put on a shirt. The only gender that a shirt has is what you as an individual assign to it. Like this to me is just one of those things where people i feel like people sometimes get too much in their feelings what are your thoughts christopher i got a couple thoughts on this one which probably doesn't surprise you um all right give it I'm to just us trying to figure out where to start like who is this person that said uh, said stuff about the east is it candace owen is that right is that her name like men in the east they know they need to be real men have you looked at the fashion that's going on in the east have you heard of k-pop do you know what the fuck's going on like you're so stupid like i don't even know what more to say you're a fucking idiot but here's the thing it doesn't fucking matter like what you wear doesn't matter it doesn't make you who you are you are a certain person and what you decide to cover yourself with or not cover yourself with doesn't fucking change that and, and and beyond that what the fuck is a manly man get the fuck out of here did you see the picture after all this thing came up ben shapiro that right wing hack took a picture with his cowboy hat on and his jeans looking like a fucking 12 year old boy give me a fucking break like 
what it, wearing a cowboy hat makes you a man, but wearing a dress makes you not a man. Like just because someone is wearing a certain thing, just because I have blue fucking fingernails, doesn't mean I'm less of a man than someone wearing a cowboy hat or wearing cowboy boots or driving a pickup truck. I don't know why all of the manly man are only people from the south. Don't, don't I don't know why pickup trucks are only in the south either. Don't I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just fucking fired up and. There, I don't even know where this clip was from. This is, how, this is how bad it's getting with some people. Like, I actually agreed with Logan Paul of all fucking people. Like, this is a dude who I don't, like, he makes me sick to my stomach a lot of times, too. But he was on, it looked like a podcast, like a video podcast, or at least a talk show of some sort. And he was getting attacked by these two other people. Like, and he's just like, dude, who the fuck cares what you, what you're wearing? It, it doesn't matter. And the fact that people are turning this into something that it's not, it just infuriates me. And it just continues to, you know, first of all, like it's, 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 it's an asinine topic in and of itself. It's an asinine belief in and of itself that, that somebody is defined by what they're wearing but let's take it one extra step further and what the fuck are you doing alienating the the trans community by doing this right because these are people who go through all sorts of different gender swaps and things you know i i feel this way but this is the body i'm in and maybe i'm going to start wearing makeup or maybe i'm going to dress this way and you know they get they get certain pride out of that right because there there are some gender for people believe that that clothes make the person some people that like changes their whole belief in themselves can you imagine like we already know that suicide rates for for people in, in certain communities are just astronomical now imagine on top of it now you have to deal with not only do i not feel like the gender that my body is but now i have to deal with i have to dress a certain way we already got the fucking bathroom thing you got to go to this bathroom like people grow the fuck up there are a lot for fuck's sake we got a goddamn motherfucker in the oval office trying to steal the motherfucking election of our goddamn country and we're worried we're worried because Harry Styles wore a fucking dress. Get the fuck out of here. That's what I got to say. I'm not even I'm not even going to say anything more because I feel like exactly what you said is what I would say. So I'm just going to let you own that. And we are now going to move. So it looks like chat is split. They want us to talk about COVID cray cray. And they want us to talk about Obama in the White well, I th House. I think, I feel I think like both of you... those were Jeff. So I think, I think Jeff changed his mind and he wants us to talk about Obama. Okay, because I was going to say, I feel like we might be able to squeeze both of those in, but let's go to Obama in the White House. Okay. So this actually really goes back to um, that conversation that we were just having about our favorite bad person. So <laughs> I got so close to Bar saying it too. <laughs> so Barack Obama was on 60 Minutes, and he was asked very pointedly about Donald Trump and some of the things that are going on. Obama said... Um, I am someone who does not blame the current partisanship solely on Donald Trump or solely on social media. Obama said, you already have seen some of these trends taking place early in my presidency, but I do think that they've kept on getting worse. Obama went on to say that he thinks Trump is an accelerant to these problems, but the problems have preceded him and they sadly are going to outlast him. Obama went on to discuss how the media landscape has changed and the voting landscape has also changed where voters have become more partisan. So for example, Obama says, some of these folks have been friends of mine and they've confessed to me, Mr. President, I know you're right on this issue, but if I vote with you on this issue, I'm gonna get killed. I'm gonna lose my seat. Because what happened is the voter base has soaked in so much information demonizing me or demonizing this issue that it becomes difficult for folks who want to cooperate to cooperate. And I feel like this, and the reason that I wanted to talk about it is because Obama really encapsulates a lot of what we're feeling. Like there's all of this information where we're talking about Trump and he's trying to rile up his base and he's trying to rile up people and get them to feel some kind of way and he's trying to get them to doubt and he's trying to get them to be bitter and he's trying to get them to demonize this election process right so then the people that they're voting for are going to be afraid of going against those people because those you know people that are elected they don't want to lose their seat they don't want to lose their position so now they're in this no-win position where even though 
they might feel like, oh, well, you know, there's no shenanigans here. They've got to play along because if they don't, their voter base, because their voter base is out here like, yeah, people been cheating. My dead uncle voted for Joe Biden. Like, <laughs> you know, like this, this is the world that we live in. And it's a very scary place, honestly. Like, I don't know what to do about it other than to own it and to talk about it and to hopefully make people think about this. What are your thoughts? Well, the first thing I'm looking at the uh, Twitch video and it kind of looks like I have a mohawk with the, uh the door buzzer behind me. Anyway, I digress. Um, no, I think I think it's a really good point. I had to read your Obama quote that's in the notes here a couple of times to to kind of understand the direction he's going in because I didn't see the 60 Minutes thing, although I want to go back and watch it. Um, yeah, so, whew, God, where to start with this? So Obama's 100% correct. This didn't start with Donald Trump. It's not going to end with Donald Trump. Right. I mean, it, it's been going on forever and it's going to go on for a while yet. I'm not going to say forever. because I really hope that we can make some progress on, you know, this this partisan splitting. And a lot of it is on, on racial lines, but there's a lot of other lines that it's that is based off of. But that's the big one right now. Right. Um, and it's, it, it wasn't it wasn't Donald Trump that created this, but he absolutely did throw gasoline on that fire. Right. Because people are much more brazen now people are much more open and okay with expressing their asshole you know racist views because it's much more accepted when you've got a guy in the oval office who you know has been at minimum uh sly about his bigoted comments and and probably more realistically very overt on his bigoted comments it makes it a whole lot easier for you to stand up and say god damn right that's my president and you know what i agree and down with those people and whatever right um so he it, he is absolutely throwing throwing gas on that fire um and the problem is to to going back to that quote is because things are so ripped apart and so separated separated right now um in in large part because of the the orange guy in the office um those people further on down the ballot they have to look at that too right for for a couple reasons so one the the their constituents are all fired up and they're they're absolutely split apart so you have to kind of judge where your people are um and and how you're going to get voted back in which shouldn't necessarily be where it's at right you shouldn't have racist views or not racist views based on whether you're going to get into office or not but that's i understand kind of why you're there but the other side and this kind of goes back to the topic when we went talked about the election is you don't want to piss that guy off because people know that he will say absolutely anything anything he will make shit up because he knows that in an hour he could take it back and people will be like ah, oh, he was just fucking kidding but he quit being a snowflake. He was just kidding about that. So, all, but that's all it takes, right? All it takes is for Mitch McConnell to, and God knows I would like him to get voted out of office, but all it takes is for him to like let one little thing slip that makes it seem like, you know, he's not on Trump's side and Trump will just, you know, blow up Twitter with, you know, Mitch McConnell's an alien and people will be like, holy shit, he's an alien. We need to get rid of him. We're going to take the pitchforks and the torches to Mitch McConnell's house. You know, like people will just go crazy. And now all of a sudden his, his, entire political career is is shot which would be great but um i think in the long and short of it is and i've, I've spelled it off for quite a while here um the 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 as much as is i like to put some blame on trump for for throwing gasoline on this he didn't start it and that's not even that's not even the crux of the issue the crux of the issue is we we as a populace are a very scared angry hateful and racist society that's just who we are as a people and it's it's disgusting and it's horrible but that's what we need to work on that's what we need to try to change we have to figure out a way that we can come together and start to make those changes in our personal lives in our in the lives of the people that are around us you know we talked when we were talking about the nfl we talked about um how we need to get minorities into the the lower levels and build them up and, and help drive that talent up same thing with politics right we it's it's great that we you know we got numb nuts out of office but but that's a small thing and honestly we as people are going to be impacted a whole hell of a lot more by local politics than we are the national national politicians so we need to start there we need to start local we need to start having these conversations we need to talk with our neighbors and our friends 
even the people we disagree with. I'm not very good at that because I just like to cuss and swear at people when they're fucking idiots and I tell them they're fucking idiots and that doesn't help anything. I'm horrible at that. But that's where we need to start. And we need to start holding our local politicians accountable for that. And we need to start voting in people into those local seats that are progressive thinkers, that aren't bigoted assholes, and people who are actually going to make change. And the more that we can do that, and the more that we can help them rise up in the ranks, the, the more that we can get these career politicians who are just following the herd, who are going to vote for this garbage that shouldn't be voted voted for and put into law, and we can get them out and we can get new voices in. AOC is a great example, right? This is someone who's rising the ranks. God, they're talking about her maybe running for president in four years. I don't know if she will or if she won't, or if she'd even get elected if she did. But I think she's a great example of someone who started you know, on a smaller scale and is kind of working her way back up. And that's what we need to do. So we need to we need to get our voices heard. That's why we do this podcast in a lot of ways, right? Is is to try to get our voices heard and hopefully engage people in conversation and and hopefully we can start to some, to make some tangible changes. Right. And I think one of the things that's important to me too is that we as a people need to be better. So I feel like we need to like you said elect those politicians who are going to hold us accountable. So if we're as a populist freaking out about something, our politician could come to us and say, "Look, Here's the decision that I'm making. Here's why I'm making it. Having that accountability, right? Because if the politician doesn't vote in the way that the populace wants, that might not be a bad thing. But it's about explaining that and not doing all of these like backroom deals yeah. and like, oh, well, I just got to align with this person because it's going to benefit me. It's like, how am I as the politician going to benefit my constituents? And that doesn't mean putting policies forth that are going to be disadvantageous to some of your populace, right? But it's also being accountable to explain why you're doing what you're doing. Right. Or why you're not taking action. Like we could spend another 15 minutes talking about Wisconsin and how the politicians in Wisconsin haven't met for however right. you know many yeah. hundreds of days when our cases of COVID are through the roof and small businesses are hurting, people are hurting, people are dying, and our politicians are fighting each other where, oh, well, you can't enact this mandate and you can't do this and you need to do more, but nope, we're not going to meet to talk about this. People are fucking dying. Do, do, you... do your goddamn job. Yep. So... Now we are going to do our job and we're going to wrap this up. We do have a couple of topics on the wheel. If you pay attention to our socials throughout the week, if we are so interested, we might cover some of these. It just depends. Some of them are topical things. Some of them are things that we might not be as fired up about, but that's going to be our goal going forward is if we leave some stuff on the wheel and it's something that we still want to talk about, we may either talk about it on uh, Sconzi's Twitch, or we're going to put that out on social. So keep your eye out for that. But for now, we are going to move to everybody's favorite. Oh, shit. I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> we're definitely not going to move for no set, shit. That's set it up shit. one more time. We are going to move forward to everybody's favorite segment. Random rankings. <laughs> and this, the random rankings, I am going to make my... Oh, shit, dude. You, you gotta... <laughs> Try it one more time. We're gonna get we're so, gonna get better, chat, and people listening in the podcast. I promise we're gonna get better. So because we're on random rankings time, I am gonna make this my Zeke Elliott feed me of the week. <laughs> so as you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and I have scoured the globe, and by that I mean I went to Google, and I found America's most Googled Thanksgiving recipes. So as Thanksgiving is coming up, I decided we're going to do a draft that we've probably already done, but we're going to do it again. We are going to draft four items each from this list of the most Googled Thanksgiving recipes. So we have items like mashed potatoes, mashed sweet potatoes, sweet potato casserole, roast turkey, pecan pie, and we get to pick four items that Christopher and I would like on our Thanksgiving plate this year. So we will see what happens, but we're going to get four items that we get to have on our plate. I'm going to put the list on the uh, on chat for everybody. So give me just a second. I was, I was going to make it five, but I'm like, there are really some repeats on here because sweet potatoes are on here like four times. So it's like, do you really want like sweet potato casserole and sweet potatoes and 
like gravy and candied yams. <laughs> well, this list is enormously huge. Holy smokes. Oh, man, that's I that know, is uh, be approved. I, mean, I can get rid of the wheel. Let's, let's clear off the wheel and we'll put this in here. We can make it a little bigger. There we go. There we go. We're getting there. All right. So that's the list. And the number, I believe, is how many, what? Well, I, well, I'm not going to guess. What does the number mean? So the number is how many states we're Googling. Got it. Okay. Cool. All right. And what I will do is I'll actually keep a running list on here for us, too. Sounds good. Do you want to do four picks or do you want to do five? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I don't think four is enough to make a full meal, so I think we need five. Okay, because I did five initially, and then I bumped it to four, so let's do five. Five is a good idea. All right, sounds good. All right, Brian and Christopher. So we've got giant Brian and Christopher here. Put that in here. I'll have this ready for next time now that we got... Uh, Getting some practice on this live podcast here, chat. All right. We are. Background opacity. Perfect. All right. So now we got to randomize. Now we got to randomize. To pick first. All right. Uh, random. Iser. Wasn't ready for that one. All right. B and C. Randomize. And. I get to go first. All right. So we're doing the snake draft style, I'm guessing, because that's what we've been doing. Yeah, let's do uh, snake draft. All right. So what are you taking as the 101 of Thanksgiving dishes? Um, well, I think you got you to gotta start with, uh, with the protein, right? I think you have to start with that. And, okay. uh, you know, a lot of times I just want ham. But, but, but when do you have turkey? Like, you have turkey on Thanksgiving. Maybe some other people have turkey other times. I have turkey on Thanksgiving. So, and plus, I figure, you know, if my family listens to this podcast and I don't pick turkey right off the bat, they'll probably shoot me. So, turkey is the number one pick. Okay, so you have roast turkey. So, the interesting part about this draft is my 101 is still available. Oh. But... But you took my 102. So the way that I'm going to go about this is I am looking at this list and I see a personal favorite, green bean casserole. I know that you already have roast turkey. There's only one other meat on here, honey baked ham. So you could be a dick and take the ham if I don't take it. <laughs> and then would I do that? I get would I do that? There was a draft where I had like no meat and I just <laughs> had like all vegetables. But I am going to start by taking the mashed potatoes. Nice. And the reason I'm going to take the mashed potatoes is because I have two picks. And now I am going to share with you my 101. My 101 for this pick was actually gravy. Now think about this. For what? Me. When you think about Thanksgiving, what do you put on your turkey? What do you put on your mashed potatoes? What do you put on your dressing? Everything gets gravy. That's fair. Because, because don't nobody want that dry turkey that like Aunt Nora done brought to the party and like they done roasted it in water because they didn't even put it in chicken broth. Yeah, but here's the thing is you take, you take a scoop of your, your mashed potatoes and then you eat that with a piece of chicken and your, or turkey and you're golden. So... You do. But gravy's still but, a good choice. Gravy, I could see that. But anything that I pick now, other than like if I were to pick something that's like sweet, I could put gravy on yeah. it and it's going to make it taste better. That's a very, very good point. So Z Dub's in the chat, so he doesn't put anything on my turkey because it's so juicy. So I will see you on Thursday. Um, but he also said green bean casserole makes me want to puke. So uh, this, this, is, this is why these drafts between Brian and I. Um, can always be a little bit interesting. Ryan loves green bean casserole. But he also knows that I would rather hit my hand with a hammer repeatedly than even think about eating green bean casserole. So he's going to save that for his last pick because he knows he doesn't have to worry about it. So I got the turkey. I could take the ham too. But, uh, okay. but I, I, want a, I want a robust meal. I want a robust meal. 
Um, and you took the sweet po- the the mashed potatoes, so I got to take the sweet potatoes. Okay. Like that's a gimme. That's that's normally what I make. Actually, that's normally my dish. Um, so are you going with the mashed sweet potatoes? Is that what you're taking? Oh, they have multiple sweet potatoes. There are mashed sweet potatoes, sweet potato casserole, sweet potato casserole with marshmallow. So what's the, what's or, the difference? Or candied yams. I don't know what the difference in all these are. We should have we should, so can- we should have summed that up as to just one, I think. So so those are all actually different to me, right? Because mashed sweet potatoes are basically like you take sweet potatoes and you mash them like you do mashed, you know, regular potatoes. Okay. Sweet potato casserole is more of like a casserole bake. And then the sweet potato casserole with marshmallows is really the same as sweet potato casserole. Okay. But the candied yams are like when you cut, think about how you might like roast carrots in the oven. Okay. That's kind of how those um, candied yams are. Like you'll put them in like the roaster pan and then you'll put like kind of like a caramel or a honey yep, yep. or some other stuff you on sold them. me. And then because that's all that's yep. how I make mine, right? It's sweet potatoes. Okay. Cut them open, stuff them with uh, well, roast them first, and then you stuff them with uh, brown sugar, and maybe a little bit of cinnamon and some marshmallows. Throw them back in the oven. So that's and toasted pecans, dude. Next level. Let me tell you. Okay. So I think candy so, jams so is, is more of what uh, what I actually want. So we're gonna go with that. Yep. Um, yep. There is green bean casserole out there. There is a uh, Jello. There's 17 more sweet potatoes that I don't need. Uh, you took the gravy. Stuffing. Pecan pie is pretty good. That's the only dessert on here? Pecan pie? I mean, you get that or jello. I don't want jello. I really want to take the ham just to be a dick, but I'm going to take the pecan pie because I need to have some dessert. I was going to say, you could have taken the ham. I would have <laughs> totally taken pecan pie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, you get the ham just by default. I need. I mean, I'm I'm a little disappointed there isn't uh, pumpkin pie on here, but I'll take the I'll take the pecan pie. I know. Like, what the hell is up All with right. that? How's there no but... like like? No, that's wrong. So this makes things pretty easy for me, right? Like, I am gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, you know, rip the bandaid here. <laughs> I've already got the mashed potatoes. I've got the gravy. I'm going to put the ham with that, right? Because ham is delicious. Like, you know, it's one of those things where you get a little bit of that, but you also get that turkey, but I don't get the turkey. So (laughs) we're going to get the ham. And then I'm a little bit torn here, right? Part of me wants to go with the sweet potato stuff, but there are legitimately like four sweet potato options. And... That's it. So I am going to go with what was my mom's favorite and that I've never been able to replicate is cornbread dressing. So cornbread dressing, typically the way that cornbread dressing works is you make cornbread and then you kind of crumple it up. And then typically you will roast some like chicken legs or chicken thighs or something like that. So you get that nice dark meat and then you kind of like crumble that up in there and you usually put like some celery in there and some sage and some of this other stuff. And then you cook that in the oven for a while and then it comes out and it's real nice and moist. And then you just eat, you eat it. So you just, you eat it? Is that what you do with it? (laughs) Hey, I I was, I was trying to keep you in Twitch compliance because I was really about to eat I, <laughs> I was about to drop a s bomb on this show dude have you been listening to me on this podcast <laughs> i have but you know all right cool i like it so those are what i got so far all right well i get to, this is this is the end of, of my draft here so i am going to take the classic stuffing i i'm not i'm not a huge stuffing fan but again it's kind of like with the turkey right like when am i ever going to eat Actually, almost all of these, except maybe the pecan pie. Like, I don't eat stuffing. I don't make candy jams. I don't make or eat turkey. Uh, like, maybe yeah. really, really rarely I end up at a restaurant and I'm like, I don't know what to eat. Oh, look, they've got turkey. But it's super, super, super rare. So, like, Thanksgiving is the one time when I have that stuff. So, we're going to add the stuffing on there. And I kind of went back and forth. I'm not sure what I want to do. Like, what's left? So, we've got more Mashed sweet potato sweet potatoes. stuff. We've got jello. Sweet potatoes. Jello and cranberry, cranberry sauce. sauce, and green bean casserole, which I could take just to spite you, but I'm not going to do it because I would just throw it away anyway. You should do it. You should do um, it. Do it. I don't like cranberry sauce traditionally, but again, I grew up where cranberry sauce was just uh, empty it out of the can and be done with it. Didn't like, never liked it. Garbage. 
and then uh i don't know five ish ten years probably closer to ten years ago now um i was making a dish to bring to thanksgiving with the family and i was like i want to make like legit cranberry sauce so i i looked around for some different um uh, some different recipes and i found a really good recipe and dude it was amazing it was so good so i'm gonna do my cranberry sauce that uh, that i make it's great stuff and i think this is a pretty legit uh this is a legit thanksgiving dinner right here man i mean i like that and i think that the cranberry sauce could even be nice for your turkey if your turkey that's right dry. no my turkey's so. gonna be gorgeous but it's just gonna <laughs> add to the gorgeousness of my turkey all right so for my last pick, I'm going to go with that sweet potato casserole with marshmallows, because if I can't have a real dessert, I may as well have like a faux dessert, right? Because if you do that sweet potato casserole with marshmallows, it really is going to be kind of like a dessert, right? Yeah, I guess. I guess so. So to recap, Christopher has turkey, candied yams, pecan pie, classic stuffing, and cranberry sauce. Winner! I, I have mashed potatoes, gravy, honey baked ham, cornbread dressing, sweet potato casserole with marshmallows, and unfortunately, none of us drafted jello because yeah. jello belongs directly in the trash. You know, actually, my aunt used to make a good what is it, pistachio jello thing? But that's like that's like a fluff. That's different. It's, I'm it's thinking made of like out of jello, red. man. All that says is jello. I can interpret it how I want. I that's my rights. <laughs> to hold into my rights. <laughs> the marshmallow fluff is delicious. I can't. Yeah, it's pretty that's legit. Delicious. All right. I should have taken marshmallow fluff. But <laughs> in any case, that is our draft for today. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are. Otherwise, we are going to move on to our extra points today. Well, what are your thoughts about that? I, I think that's a great thing. I'll let you kick that off. But first, chat, I know we got a couple people out there. Um, do we have any opinions? Who won? I mean, you just put Sconzi in the chat. That's fine. We all know. But but what do you think? Who won between, between me and I? I mean, I got turkey. That automatically is a win, right? Like, it's Thanksgiving. I man. mean, it kind of is, right? Like, I knew that this draft was already going to be skewed to whoever got the first pick, but I did what I could. You did? No, you got a good meal. I would not be upset with that meal. We got one vote for Sconzi. We'll see if Jeff's still hanging out. We'll get his thoughts, too. I mean, Jeff's a Cubs fan. Can you really trust him, though? Ha! Huh. Jeff says I'd go to either house for dinner. No winner. Well, I think that means one to nothing live chat Sconzi wins. But we'll see what those at home say once we uh, we put the recording out there. And the video, by the way, this is a quick tip, will be out on YouTube. So I'm going to go, I'm going to put all these recorded podcasts out on the video out on YouTube. So that's something you guys can go check out too. Nice. Cool. All right, B. Uh just plain jeff says uh hey i usually vote brian be nice um but we're gonna go ahead and kick it off to our extra points um b why don't you kick us off what do you got so today i want to tell you all a personal story i don't typically share a lot of personal stories but i want to share a personal story in the vein of thanksgiving and in the vein of people being really concerned about COVID 19. so I um, have an anniversary that just passed, the anniversary of my mother's death. My mother died a week before Thanksgiving eight years ago. I remember this very vividly because it was one of the most foundational and changing moments of my life. And one of the things that sticks out to me about that time is the kindness of others. I distinctly remember the night that I called on, you know, four of my friends and all of those people were at the hospital with me while I was there saying goodbye to my mother. I remember sleeping on Sconzi's couch the night that my mother died because he told me, I don't want you going home and being by yourself tonight. I remember I was going to be alone for that Thanksgiving and two of my friends said, nope, we're going to invite you to come and be with our family. And there's a lot of people who are hurting right now because they know that they can't go and be with their family. They know that they are safer being at home and not 
socializing. But one of the things that I want to encourage people to do is even if you can't go see your family this Thanksgiving, let them know that you care about them. Do something nice for someone, not because it benefits you, but because it's something that might mean the world to someone else. After this anniversary passes, every time that it does, I think about the things that all of these friends did for me in that difficult time. And I want to think about how I can give back to other people. So this Thanksgiving, my challenge to you as an extra point is this week, do something nice for someone, just one thing out of the goodness of your heart and see how that makes you feel. Don't do it with any expectation. Don't do it with any thought that you're going to get anything in return, that they're going to appreciate it, that they're going to say thank you. Do it because it's the right thing to do. And just think about how that's going to make you feel. Because for me, if I can remember this stuff from eight, nine, ten years ago, think about what that might do for somebody else. Those are powerful words, man. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm gonna. I should. I should have went first this week. Um, I'm gonna share something actually, kind of in the same vein, which is which is reaching out and helping people. So. Um, this time of year, the holiday times, always brings me back to when I was younger. And growing up, we we weren't a well-off family. I, we were a poor family. Um, we generally had food on the table. Um, you know, we, we got Christmas gifts. You know, we got together for, for Thanksgiving. But, uh, but we were not super stable like we were one of those families where if one thing goes wrong we could have been on the streets and um i was thinking a lot today about actually the last couple of days about how to how to help others and what i really wanted to do was kind of do the either donate or somehow get involved with with food over the holidays and um, it's just it's just too late so i'm going to transition that we're going to talk more about that in coming weeks both on the stream and on the podcast, some stuff to do around Christmas time. Um, and I've got a personal story for that one too, but we'll save that for, for the next time, maybe next week. But when we were younger, I specifically remember a day when uh, there was a box of food placed outside our door um, because we were in a situation where we weren't going to have Thanksgiving dinner. And, uh, it's it sounds it sounds silly it sounds kind of stupid um but we were all excited looking at the stuff oh my god we got ham or we've got green bean casserole or we got whatever it is right like we were so excited because we knew we were going to have a, a a happy thanksgiving because someone gave to us and i think it's super important this time of year there's a lot of people struggling uh this the, even be even even if there wasn't this whole pandemic going on, people would be struggling. But this just adds to it, and this is a time of year when nobody should be struggling. I mean, I I hate people to be struggling at all, right? But the holidays I think hold a special time in a lot of people's hearts, and I think it's a time where, as Brian eloquently said, we need to think beyond our ourselves, and we need to help people however we can, whatever that looks like. Um, whether that's donating, whether that's volunteering, if you can do that, um, whether it's just reaching out to people that you know, um, maybe have a hard time, you know, whatever the case may be, but this is a time of year where it's super important for us to to really reach outside of our normal circle and, and try to help wherever we can. So just as Brian said, I'm not gonna put a, I'll let, I'll let his his request stand for this week and then I'll take, I'll, I'll take over probably next week um but let's just let's just be happy let's share love with everyone that we possibly can because we all need more love and uh, let's try to do something nice for for someone else i agree and one of the last things that i wanted to add to that is think about this is perspective is either your power or perspective is your prison right so i steal that from trent shelton but thinking about Thanksgiving and a lot of people missing their families. 
you know, one of the things that you can do is be bummed out about the fact that you can't see them and that's totally legitimate. But there's also power in the fact that you can pick up the phone and call them or you can open up a computer and do a Zoom call with them or you can bake a dozen cookies and if your sister lives three miles away, you can take them to her house and do ding dong ditch and like Christopher's <laughs> story, leave cookies on the doorstep. Like these are the type of things that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about having to go give somebody $500. I'm not talking about, you know, having to make a big commitment. It might be, you know, walking up to someone and just genuinely telling them like, hey, that jacket looks great on you. Or, hey, you know, I hope you're doing good today. Or, hey, thank you for everything that you've done for me. Because these are small incremental things that we don't often even think about that could mean the world to someone else. So sometimes putting yourself out there and doing these things is very important because we never know when the next time that we're gonna be able to do that is. Sounds good. I think we can wrap it up at this point. Um, B, you want to let the people know where they can find us? So they can find us everywhere. They can find <laughs> us fleeting and tweeting and on Twitch. All right. So on Twitch, we are at twitch.tv backslash Sconzi, S-K-O-N-Z-I-I. We will be doing the live stream on Friday nights at 530 Central Time. So if you want to see Skanzi's beautiful face and you want to see the photo of me, you can do that. Um, you can also find us on Twitter. You can interact with the show in general at Almost Qualified Productions. Our Twitter is A-Q underscore P-R-O-D. You can find me on Twitter at Landmark, M-K-E, L-A-N-D-M-A-R-K, M-K-E. And you can find Christopher on Twitter at Skonzi, S-K-O-N-Z-I-I. -I. And if you really want to follow his most innermost oh thoughts, boy. those things that are only shared on the podcast when he calls his favorite politician a bad person, <laughs> you can follow him at Big C underscore M-K-E. But going forward, we're just going to plug him as Skonzi because he is the Santa of this show. Sounds about right. All right, y'all. Well, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We wish you the best. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Christopher, for everything that you've done. Thank you, listener, for everything that you've done. And we hope that you will join us next time on We Random. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Night, y'all. Fucking sound didn't work. God damn it. <laughs> well, I guess I know our outtake is going to be. <laughs>